had it. Have you actually been recording this whole fucking thing? Probably. Yeah. I was saying, probably when he was fucking around before we started talking. You. Uh, you go. Oh, God, you whore. I know, right? Okay. There's been a lot of editing. <laughs> <laughs> or we just let it ride. No. <laughs> All right, so. Let's cool. get this really started. All right, so episode one. This is the new Uppsala podcast. My name is Robert. Uh, I'm the new Oathsworn Gothi, a part of the school. Been really loving it so far. Been doing it for a year and a half so. Been ordained for almost coming up on two months now. Um, and been loving it ever since. Started the new program of Path of the Raven. If you have not seen... Um, it's where the social media is. I'm basically the social media person because um, they don't really do anything. So <laughs> we do some things, just not as much on the social media. He's like, <laughs> I don't. So you're good. Yeah, he does nothing. Yeah. <laughs> nothing. <laughs> so uh, part of our outreach program that I suggested was starting a podcast where we can teach each and every one of you a little bit about what we do, what our focus is, and various topics and we can digest it um soon enough if it's been demanded we can do like a ask me anything every fifth episode something like that where we have a whole list of questions you guys have and we will go through each and every one of them uh now if there's too many we might cut some out but that's that discussion for later time and that's the end of my introduction if anyone else wants to go um so, my name is Sigvidir Ulfar. I have been an Oathsworn Gothi for coming on five years now. Um, a Norse pagan for close to 11. I know I'm fairly young in the basis of heathenry for some people. However, um, I run the Order of the Wolf within New Uppsala. We are the magic and ritual side of what the Gothar do more aptly others um so anything from rituals like bloats symbols weddings funerals anything like that that falls on us as well as a lot of blessings for homes or other sides of magic so that's what we do in the order of the wolf and i will turn this over to white wolf i'm excited to see you guys this is fun. anyway uh i'm white wolf uh, I've been doing this a long time. Um, solo practicing for I don't know how long. Um, I just got a little thing in of uh, ordainment of an anniversary of ordainment that apparently I was legally ordained in 2004, which didn't know that. So I got that in the email the other day. So that's when I got legally ordained, not when I became a Gothi. So imagine like it's been far before that. Um, I've been doing it for a long time. So I was kind of young till so I was too old. Um, Solo wandering for a long time in the state of Utah, which if you know anything about Utah, it's not heathen. And so <laughs> I was, felt like I was on my own, um, dead for a long time. Eventually came across a lot of like-minded individuals, very fantastic people. Um, started to develop our own course of study, things like that. And started to actually be able to branch off in our own knowledge bases, which is really great. Um, currently, I am still in the United States, but I travel a shitload. Um, all over the world. Um, anytime anybody needs something in another country, I'm more than happy to abide. One, because it's a vacation. Two, because I love what I do. Um, we are actually able to, in this new Uppsala group, legally ordain others. Um, so when we talk about ordainment, which eventually will happen, um, it's something that we are actually able to do. Not just say we are Gothar to a certain degree, but to actually enact legally our responsibilities of the Gothar, such as weddings, funerals, things like that. So... I'm White Wolf. It was a name given to me by very, very old people. They had very, very white beards. It's fantastic. <laughs> Go ahead. So when you're talking about ordainment, right, and the whole process, you brought up marriage and various other topics. Can you go more in depth than what you mean by that, White Wolf? And I mean, so it kind of comes down to the description of a Gothar and ordainment, right? Two very different topics, two very different things. One is world renowned of every religion you know priests or whatever else are all ordained um, in some legal sense to perform actions such as marriages funeral rites baby naming blessings even final rites and or being a religious 
counselor, I guess. Someone can go, like, someone that can actually visit penitentiaries and actually talk to inmates, talk to loved ones, be a marriage counselor, things like that. These are actually like legally binding things where it's different between just being a Gothar and becoming an ordained Gothi or Gothar themselves. Um, so anybody can be a Gothi. We'll start that off right now is literally anybody watching us, listening to us, doing their own thing. If you are at home with one other person, even yourself, and you're performing a bloat, a symbol, a little ritual, you just hail the gods officially and in descriptive terms, you are a Gothi, right? You're representing the bridge between the gods and the people. Even that, even that people is just you as a person. Um, now, as an ordained person or human being in any kind, um, we get to have the legal matters and ramifications of being able to legally marry people, meaning we can sign the marriage certificates, perform the rituals and rites, send it in, have them by the federal government, bound, tax-wise, all that crap, and everything with it. Same thing with legally, uh, or with uh, baby naming ceremonies. Um, funeral rites. Anybody can do funeral rites officially, but a lot of folks like to have somebody that's somehow ordained or, or spiritually attuned to do these things, unless it's a family member, which is totally fine. Um, so they're kind of a difference between like a, a Gothi and an oath sworn hash or slash ordained Gothi. So ordainment just gives us the legal opportunity and ability to exist across all states and most countries. Our ordainment does exist into every country except for like a couple, and it's like North Korea. So like we're fine. Um, but those are kind of the differences between like what we do and what we can legally do as ordainment. If that makes sense. Yeah, that makes uh, perfect sense. Thanks for uh, going more in depth. I know, um, I mean, I knew what the answer was, but I wanted uh, various other people to know what the answer was and see what uh, we can offer as a school that some might not other. Um, so we talked, um, Sigvita Ufar, you went into description of your discipline uh, order um, and I didn't really go too much into depth of it, so if we want to start off with that and then go into uh, what New Uppsala is, you know, it kind of, I mean, we're kind of fucked already in our little organization period, so we'll do orders and then go into what the school actually is. Sure. Yeah, I mean, we can. Yeah. All right. So you got the Path of the Raven. Um, so essentially... The bread and butter of this is you love helping people. Um, that's what your passion is. That's what you want to do in life. Um, the goal of this is to teach as many people and be a coexistent uh, group. The path of the raven, you're going to learn each and every religion and try to coexist with them. As hard as that is, but that's the mission. Um Taking it upon the self to do the social media aspect, possess the outreach program. That's kind of what a raven does. Um, according to the lore, we can go further in depth in that and future topics of discussion. But yeah, uh, outreach program, learning about religions, counseling. There's the other topic of discussion for Path of the Raven. Uh, what we do is we specialize in counseling. You value your secondary education when secondary means, you know, your continuation of education past high school. Either seminars, official colleges, or uh, certifications, anything like that. You value secondary education to help you help others. And that's that's the path of the raven. Very nice. Um, and yeah, I didn't get into what I do for the school as well, outside of what these two do. Uh, mine is the discipline of the sentinel. Um, unlike other things, I like to bring myths and stories into reality. I like to see what we talk about and what is. Uh, now, that's obviously an entire compound thing of UPG and like what we feel, dream, experience that can't be explained or proven. It can be explained, but maybe not proven. Um, the point of the discipline of the Sentinel is to understand our past, 
dig into the lore in aspect of artifacts, people, things like that that may, may not have been discovered yet, and bring it to light or to the future. Um, so we basically research and reenact and find the timelines of even namesakes of families, artifacts, research, anything at all, and we try to find if and where it currently exists in our modern times. A lot of times, obviously, there's a lot of things being said about Odin's spear, uh, Moses' staff, all sorts of these things that happen in biblical or mythological terms, and I like to be the one that looks into it and says, okay, but what happened in the story after that story, right? So in the Discipline of Sentinel, we take very real-world facts and translate them from the stories themselves. So we go from mythological to actual. Alrighty then. Um, I just kind of wanted to. Robert said something yeah. a little while ago that just made me laugh. Because so I was like, you just made us sound like monsters. You're like, oh yeah, we, we care about people in the Path of the Raven. And I'm just sitting here like, damn, dude. Oh yeah. You Throw us wrong. right under the bus. <laughs> like, I just care about stuff. <laughs> okay. Like, people, people find stuff, and that's what we do. <laughs> yeah, that, that's, a, that's a good uh, description. When I, what I meant <laughs> when talking about caring about other people, it's purely we get a professional education and a professional grasp on, like, what to say instead of it being trial through error. So that's... You're the, you're the, you're the book smart. Yeah, I'm. Yeah, that's that's pretty smart about it. I'm very book smart. Oh, uh, I'm not. Raven's book smart. Street smart. Execute. I just get them both, oh, and I just okay. I like to put the two together and see where they collide, and then I'm like, I'm that guy. Okay. Okay. I'm okay. the. I'm the. I'm the guy. I've got a guy for that. I'm that guy. <laughs> yeah, you're the one that tells them. Okay, you need the street smart one. Or you yeah. book smart guy. <laughs> it's a great uh, analysis of you know what we all do around here. <laughs> what is it? Um, cool, that's awesome. No, yeah, and it is really good. I'm actually I I when Sigvider Ufar said his part on his placement, I'm like, oh, I should talk about this little essential. Didn't at all. So that was a good. That was a good call out. Um, Robert, if you want to, or whomever else, you want to talk about like what New Uppsala is that we represent? I mean, I did the introduction, and then you okay. went over adornment, so Secret of Ufar, take it the way. Okay. So, the school of New Uppsala was a brainchild of me and White Wolf, uh, probably how many years ago? I don't know. I, I, it had to have been before I came. A while uh, ago. Before um, I moved to States, which was long ago ish. Yeah. So, a long time ago, this was this brainchild of me and White Wolf where we were like, okay, we've seen other programs, other schools, other things. And in our very humble opinion, the, some of them were lacking in areas and others weren't. And this is there and that's there. We said, okay, cool. I wonder if we can do it better. So we decided to start to formulate this idea of how do we do this? How do we teach this next generation of Gothar outside of what we know and possibly learn from them along the way and build that relationship so that we have not only camaraderie, but a community of Gothar that we can go, hey, I've got this crazy idea. I want to know if it'll work. Now we have this community of Gothar that we can bounce these things off of. And the other side of it, the other major piece I really wanted to touch on was it granted every, no, I don't want to say everyday heathens, uh, the larger community access to Gothar more readily and in a place where they can go, oh, I've got this question about this, but I can never find an answer. I can never figure out where this was, and I just don't have the time to vote, or whatever it may be. And they now have an entire school of Gothar that will go right here. And this is what we know. This is what we've studied. And if we don't have the answer, we'll go find it. Because um, we are on this continual path of knowledge. But New Uppsala started as a brainchild to, one, help Gothar around the world and give a sense of community to them, as well as to help the larger community of heathenry and other pagan groups, honestly, 
and give them a source of knowledge that they could go, I don't know how to do a wedding ceremony for Norse paganism. I don't know how to do the hand fasting for that. And they can go, oh yeah, there's that one place, that New Uppsala place. All those guys, they know how to do it. So we wanted to give that outreach to saying, we're here and give that open invitation to come ask us questions. Come hang out at Midsummer. Do these things. Come come be around a bunch of Gothar that they prattle for hours and speak absolute nonsense and sometimes sound like we're speaking in tongues. But we wanted to give that access to everybody and to train the new generation of Gothar to be far better than we ever will be or could have been. We wanted to broaden that and more perspective. So yeah, that's what New Uppsala is, at least in my opinion. White Wolf may have things to add. I mean, I, I always have things to add. Yeah. I'm, I'm just full of words and not enough pages to put them on. Um, no, that's great. I, I really agree with that. Um, so um, coming into this, I wanted to make sure I was not prepared, because I'm not, but mildly prepped for some sort of conversation off New Uppsala. Um, a lot of things that Sigurd Udafar just hit are round the head, basically what I was looking at. Um, New Uppsala, our purpose, and the way I see it at least, uh, is preserving knowledge of our... And I, I'm, I'm reading this because I literally wrote this shit down, because I'm not good. Um, so, <laughs> uh, preserving knowledge of our ancestral past by bringing the practices, information, and parts of the culture into our modern age or the future. Um, now... I am actually interested to hear the other two's topics or opinions on this of why it's called New Uppsala as opposed to it just becoming what it is, right? So I'll start by saying what I've kind of put on paper, at least, so that I don't lose my train of thought on why it is called that. So New Uppsala obviously is based off of Uppsala or Old Uppsala. Um, having been one of the, one of, if not, the most revered and important hubs for our ancestors. Um, we hope to create an environment where others can gather, swap stories, learn from each other's practices, and most importantly, teach those that are seeking knowledge in regards to being a spiritual leader. Almost verbatim what Sigurd S- S- Udfar just said, um, like I said, he nailed it on the head. Um, a lot of time people think Uppsala, right? And they, they fantasize it in the sense of the show Vikings, they see the giant temples, they see things. Realistically, it's a lot of mounds and not a lot of temple. And so you can go there to this day, and it's gorgeous. It's a fantastic site. Um, it's got, you know, King Bjorn's grave site, which is one of the most pleasant places to picnic at. And it's also got other mounds all over the place. So Uppsala itself is made for a communal base. It's made to be gathered to. It's made for others to come to. Way back in our ancestral time, it was a se- certain sense of religious experiments or spiritual enlightenment where they'd come together as a whole and experience these things together. Um, in my opinion, at least, which, you know, we all have our own, New Uppsala represents us saying we are not what that is. We are trying to get what that was and recreate to a degree where it makes sense in the future. Uh, but I am interested to hear Robert's, at this point, view. Hold on. I like where you said... Oh. King Bjorn's grave is a great place to picnic at. Like, yeah, let's just go have a picnic in a graveyard. Like, okay, first of all, it literally is. It's a giant mound. If you get it right in the right season, there's like cattle grazing. There's a real, like, a little pond river that flows through it. And there's daisies and shit everywhere. Like, it is gorgeous. So, it's a real thing. Like, if you look that shit up, it is one of the best places in the Uppsala Valley, or what they call it. To have a gathering, sit down, relax, have some food. It's gorgeous. Yeah. So, yeah. Feel uh, so, something came to mind, and I want to use this passage because it makes me think of what New Uppsala is. It's uh, Havamal, and you'll have them, you'll hear them say all the time that uh, I practice the Havamal way too much because I'm always the quiet one. I always don't say a lot. <laughs> so Havamal stands at 77 cows die family die you will die the same way I know only one thing that never dies the reputation reputation of the one who dies so essentially it's we're going to die but what we stand for is not going to die it's going to transcend our 
earthly or Midgardian lifetime. Um, so w when it comes to New Uppsala, it's I don't want to beat the beat the bush, but just teaching how that's not a phrase, huh? The bush. Beat the bush. I've never heard that in my life. I literally said a Sunday. Sorry. Go. No, you're good. <laughs> I feel like beat a dead horse to glue, which sounds really dark, but makes it into what it is. All right. Like, I don't want to oversay stuff. Is that better? All right. Thank I have no problem with it. <laughs> so, New Uppsala is the school that we're going to be the focal point. And this is the idea is to be the focal point, And we're all going to branch out. And it sounds very Christianized by like, Having like a single thing like the you know the uh, the catholics but we're not the catholics we're pagans and we uh we go in nature and we do weird shit uh but yeah uh really like post on that shit like, i was very contrast like i'm i was trying really hard not to say like certain words he's like hit the roadblocks with the truck and just said what we're gonna say cool uh <laughs> i like it um Oh my God. there are like three topics between the three of us that I was like, oh, that would be a great one to dive into, like the Catholics being pagan. Oh, don't. That's a one. Not right now. Uh, we, we got like a whole ass hour. Well, I'm going to ask a whole ass hour. We, I'm not even done with what I'm asking with Stephen Udafar on why it's called New Uppsala. So like that's All right. why. All right, let's go. Let's go. So, um, again, brainchild of me and Wolf and... We were sitting there, and I was like, what are we going to call this place? Eventually, we're going to have this brick-and-mortar school where we have our novitiates, our students, running around, looking through stuff, reading, meditating, going through the practices, very much so like the pagan monks, because I don't know where both are. But um, when they would sit in Uppsala and they would meditate, what are we going to call it? What would we call this place of community, this place where we gather everyone? And then I was watching Vikings one day, and I was like, Uppsala. And I kind of went, huh. I started doing a lot more history research on what Uppsala was and where it was and what happened there and how long it was pagan and the Christianity took over in the Temple of New Uppsala and when all that happened. And you know what? I like that name because it was the focal point of community in that area. It was one of the most renowned places for pagan worship that existed it's one that most people know when you say Uppsala most heathens will go oh yeah I heard about that so I took that and said well I can't call it Uppsala there's still a town in that country that's named Uppsala Norway I swear it's in Sweden uh, I swear there's an Uppsala, Uppsala is, Sweden too. Uppsala is in Sweden yeah okay come on history nerd there's a few oh <laughs> We're not going to Oslo and shit. Anyway. Um, but I was like, okay, can't call it that. But then being born in the U.S., I was like, well, we have New York. We have New Hampshire. I was like, Wait, screw what? it. Wait, what? New Hampshire? Yeah. You should have just said New Mexico and moved on. <laughs> Did you, what'd you say? New Hampshire? Yeah, it's where, it's where New Frodo's from. Oh, uh, yeah. Silly uh, me. Duh. <laughs> Wait, who's New Frodo? Um, uh, who's New Hampshire? <laughs> so, so uh, here's the joke. <laughs> All right, cool. <laughs> Makes it even better. You're a hamster, so you know what? Uh, no, I'm a Jotun. Like... All right. Cool. Sorry, to, sorry to cut you off. A uh, little tangent, but... Go on. You're good. Oh, so you but, no. New Uppsala? That's that's where I thought of the name first, and then me and Wai Wolf battled over it for a while, so I'll let him tell the story of how we battled over the name of our school for a little while. Oh, you overestimate my memory. Um, I will start by saying, though, we have referred to twice, maybe three times, on the show Vikings. Now, usually when I hear people say that, I kind of discredit their entire mental resources entirely. Um, this is not something that is inspired by that, done by that, quoted that, all that crap. 
Um, while that is a fantastic source of material in certain aspects, just like many, many, many materials are on different streaming platforms, um, by no means of what we talk about, what we are, what we represent, is something that is based off of Vikings. Um, that is a very great show in some aspects. It's mostly just entertainment, but it is somewhat historically accurate in some sort of aspects. So when we say, like I've said it, and Steve Duba have said it, I was watching Vikings, from Vikings, things like that. I don't want that to be an emphasis on what we're trying to display or even attempt to recreate because that's not a recreation of anything. So I just want to put that out there because when I hear like, oh, I was watching Vikings the other day, all of a sudden like, I just like don't hear anything else they say for the rest of the sentence. Like, and I guess I can explain why we use it so readily in some of our explanations is because a lot of people know what the show is. And it's a relationship point. Um, like Robert was talking about with our community outreach and what he does. Um, oftentimes you'll see him on different streaming platforms and stuff playing Assassin's Creed Valhalla. Is it historically accurate to anything? Maybe. They kill people. Oh. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I raid monasteries. I blow a horn. Okay, so we got that aspect. Um, but... We use common pop culture references. Um, you'll never hear me reference Marvel outside of right now, except for when I'm bashing on them. But we use those because it's a relationship point. Something that people can go, oh yeah, I watched that too. Or I know what you're talking about because I remember that from the show. So we can I use it as a reference point for a lot of different things. Some of the more complex or like we're talking about the name of the school. I was watching Vikings one day, and a lot of people go, oh yeah, I remember that, 9 of 9 and everything going on at Uppsala. That's why we reference stuff like that a lot more, or you'll see, hear Robert eventually at some point mention Rick Riordan, I'm sure, oh, yeah. um, and definitely. his Magnus Chase books. Hey, so oh, go all right, I'll go over that next. <laughs> but you'll hear us reference pop culture things, and by no means do we follow any of most of the pop culture stuff. There are some things that we find in those shows where we'll go, is that accurate? And then we dive. We'll go through multiple different areas of books, multiple different sagas, trying to decipher what they were doing, where they got the information they got it from, and kind of break it down. If it, we find it interesting, I'll dive into it. But yeah, that's why we use pop culture references so that people can relate a little bit easier to what we're saying. Instead of us going on and rambling and speaking in tongues like I said before, it's great. Cool. But yeah, that's why. Robert, go ahead. Do you know why it's called Uppsala? Or what are your thoughts? Pop culture using oh, yeah, pop culture as, oh, okay. a, as a media platform to outreach. So it's a great focal point of getting a common ground. If all right, we're talking about a brand new baby heathen, a brand new baby Norse pagan. Yeah, just a little, it's a little guy or girl. It's squishy. It's like a smart smell out. <laughs> um, or if you're talking to a Christian, what is Norse paganism? Have you seen Marvel? You know what Odin and Thor is? Well, I believe it's not like that, but I believe in those gods' names. It's... It's where they can figure out where you're coming from. Um, now, there's a lot of pop culture. I mean, paganism has been on the rise very recently within Hollywood. I mean, you got Barbarians, uh, Last Kingdom, which there's a new movie coming out. Um, so I'm excited about that. I plan on watching that and deep diving into it in a bunch of other shit but yeah uh it's a great focal point of a start date uh, a foundation um my first foundation of norse paganism was vikings and i don't i don't discredit anyone who's like yeah the only thing i know so far is what viking has told me i was like okay cool you have a starting point i don't have to tell you who odin is who thor is or what Ragnarok is. I don't have to give you every little bread crumble. I just have to be like, uh, beat you. Well, beat you, but not, uh, so 
I'm going to use this metaphor as like you're an iron ingot and I got to mold you into a sword. That's how I'm going to use that. And now, I've been playing too much World of Warcraft for you to use that reference just oh, now. Yeah. Thank how many Suck. hours do you got? I just imagined it, the whole thing as I just did it for like three hours today. <laughs> <sighs> about beating someone or about no i work working my blacksmithing on world of warcraft wow. and then <laughs> wow. that's wow. all that was my plug sorry that hurt inside for me oh, i'm sure it did <laughs> i feel bad for you that's <laughs> but yeah uh so why is it called back on topic let's get back on topic everyone i know usually i'm the one that brings everyone back while they're rambling but i'm the one rambling just trying to be, you know, fill in the gaps. But why you, you brought yourself back on topic. Hey, I do my best. Someone's got to do it, and it might as well be me. Just pat myself on the back right there. Uh, so why is it called New Uppsala? Yeah. Why not? Not right. I mean, <laughs> it's hard to like describe i mean like i wasn't there for the naming i was just like i just talked to sigler ufar and i was like hey so uh you're an ordained oswar gothi i've been interested in that for a couple years now or for more help <laughs> a big drive of what it is too is to represent something that's physical not just metaphorical or virtual uh because Uppsala is a real place new Uppsala, we intend to have a close-knit, real-life, in-person community doing these things. So it, it became sort of a realistic timeline standard to have the name that wasn't just like, Heathens Are Us, and have like this virtual compound of thousands of heathens that come around. This was actually made to make a physical place where we can gather together on expenses not made by stu or made possible by students or whatever else. It was just made to be physical. And that's kind of Uppsala's concept. Because we would travel to Uppsala, have this experience, have this place because they went to somewhere, we intend for New Uppsala to have that somewhere for people to go. Whether that is virtual, unfortunately, or more fortunately, it would be physical. And that's kind of the, the Uppsala behind it. All of that's in work. It's on its own timeline, however. Um, but yeah, it will at some point in the next... I want to say like 10 years. Do you guys concur with that? Something like that. I mean... Something like that. It will be a brick and mortar place where we can gather heathen. Until then, it's just a random land grab of the properties that we own and use. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, so you brought up a really good point of getting New Uppsala as a physical location. The point of this podcast is to hopefully generate funds so, you know, we don't have to break our own bank accounts as much as we already do. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm more than happy to put $10,000 towards something, but um, that's not the, that's, that's kind of not the point is to be soul uh, generation. No, not, that's, that's not what I mean. Generating, generating. yeah. Thank uh, you. You're good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and I mean, like, what we're doing now is just a reach out for or a, a reach out program or an outreach program. That's the one. Um, what we do as a school, things like that. Um, a little bit more on the the actual school itself is we do provide services to actual people. Um, contracts and people have been hired already. Um, students, mentors, heads of orders, things like that have done actual rituals, actual rites that have been sought out by individuals of the community, um, whether they are heathen or in any way, shape, or form wanting to have something happen. Um, anything from weddings to house cleansing, things like that, have already been and do incur or do continue to happen through our studies and our students. Um, now, that is in no way negotiated by who is hired by them, um, but it's more who is reached out. So... Hypothetically, if Robert were to do a ritual or something for somebody, if they reached out to them, it wouldn't go through Robert for negotiations or terms, whatever else. Uh, we do have a structure in place of this school. Uh, we are training the next religious and spiritual leaders, um, practicing bloats, rituals of any kind, and 
providing these services for people in the real world. Sometimes people in the real world do need these services. We see them on Facebook all the time. We see all these different things on posts here and there. And obviously, free advice is free advice. We give it all the time. We, it's what we're doing now. Uh, we just kind of give us our, the information out there and see if others want to be more interested. Um, however, if certain circumstances arise where someone needs a blessings of some kind, it can be anything of any kind of bloat, sumble, um, rune poles, anything you need, um, we do provide the services for it. Um, that's when this comes down to more of a, a financial term. Uh, we do hire out, we, because we train, because we do certain things, because we're legally ordained, because we start do certain things that others can't, um, occasionally we do offer or we do charge for our services in that sense. So yes, I mean, obviously donations are donations, um, but we do intend to have the school itself be a self-funding entity outside of what we do now. Now what we do now is obviously an outreach to make sure that happens, but kind of a... Uh, it's kind of two hands shaking of like the podcast and the school to make sure it all comes together. And that that's and, the pure point of it. Um, I just wanted to say before Sigur Uvar takes the mic, uh, uh, we are not doing this to make ourselves rich at all. We are doing this because of a passion, because of what we love, and because of the oath we took. Um, we're we're doing this to help others. We're not doing it to better myself financially, um, or help my children out in the future by setting up a four hundred one k or whatever. Uh, but it's purely for the next generation of Gothar after I die that this program, that this community stays around. And Mike goes to Secret Ufar. Sorry for cutting you off. Oh, you're good. I was actually going to say just about the same thing. And the reason that we do occasionally charge for those kind of services is plane tickets ain't cheap. Gas isn't cheap. Materials can be extremely expensive. Uh, go down to Home Depot and look up a solid oak wood board yep. that is part of some of the materials that I use. Oof. That stuff can get expensive. So it's not in order to make us money. Sometimes we will put some money back towards the school to keep the lights on to maintain the ground. Stuff like that in the future or in for right now to fund and build that fund to purchase the property and build this temple of no Uppsala. um but it is not to make us rich that's on my own time that's something i have to do personally if i tried to swindle my way through stuff that would be ridiculous and i would hate myself for it um so i don't want to do that now there is always the perception of as soon as somebody asks for money for a service unfortunate that that happens but in reality we truly want to just help you want to help people and do things and if um for example i did a house cleansing for somebody nearby to where i live and they were experiencing some terrible things i said you know what i'm just gonna come over there i'm gonna do this i don't care don't pay me you're struggling, your kids aren't sleeping, you're not sleeping, you're spiraling. I was like, nope, don't care, I'm going to come do this because you're one of, or a member of our community, that's my job. However, if I would have had to drive 500 miles to get to where they were, yeah, I'm going to need some gas money, I'm sorry. <laughs> I am not a bottomless pit of money, I am not wealthy yet. I always use the word yet. Um, but... Again, we truly want to do this because we swore that oath. We chose to take this path. We want to help our community grow and sustain and to help each other. Read that mutual respect of helping. So that's what we're all about. It's not about the money. We do want the brick and mortar school just because I would love to host a midsummer. At New Uppsala, invite everybody out and just say, come hang out for a little while. Come experience midsummer surrounded by heathen. Out in your backyard, surrounded by your close knit friends, but among heathens. Among as many heathens as we can. I want that experience. And I know a lot of heathens want that experience too. And thanks to TikTok, some of those things have already happened. 
and I'm not going to plug them because that's not where we're at right now. But some of those things are happening, and that that process is starting again. Super excited for it, and I would love to get on board with all of that. Find a home for heathen. Yeah. Hello. Um, yeah, I mean everything we say is true, and it's our opinions, obviously. Um, but the idea of this is we're starting this podcast to answer questions, discuss topics in our perspective. Now, our perspective or our line of sight is from a Gothi stamp. Um, now, Gothi and Gothar, Gothar the plural, Gothi being the male role, Gothia being the female role. Um, obviously, we're trying to portray or at least give people the experience to experience Gothi. Because actually, a lot of people, as common as we feel it is because we are ones, um, don't have access to a Gothi, Gothia, or the Gothar as a whole. Now, I did say earlier that anybody can be one in your representation, but as far as a path, a lifestyle choice, things like that, it's not as common. Um, you can't just go to the woods and ask for a Gothi like you can go to a church and ask for a priest. Um, it's a little bit different, a little harder to find, a little harder to track down in a lot of places around the world. Um, that's why we do travel a lot, that's why we do these things. Um, so I would like to kind of pick Robert's brain at the beginning and we can or pass it around to whoever else on what makes a Gothi a little bit different than just like the everyday Facebook page heathen type of thing. Hey, hold on. Can we just, you said, I'm going to keep bringing up the stuff you guys say like mid sentence. Cause it just cracks me up. Cause I'm like, we you know this. Imagine walking into the woods and being like, I need a Gothi, and like some dude like, steps out from behind a tree, and, like leans over, and is like, the. <laughs> like, I wouldn't trust that guy. I'd be terrified. Hey, yeah, I don't know what to do. Wait, so you wouldn't trust him? Like, I would trust him. I'd be like, wh where, what, what are you? Where do you live? <laughs> I'd have like basically, I would interview this guy for like ten minutes on why some guy just walked out from behind a tree before I was like. Okay, but I live in a place where, like, they might just be on drugs. So I just want to <laughs> I just want to read that. Out. <laughs> but but the, the position is we're in the woods, so you're not you're not in this uh, location that you're currently staying in. You're in the middle of the woods, and someone's what's up? What you need? First of all, if I did that and a guy came out or a woman came out, I don't give a fuck who came out. If anything came out of a tree or behind a tree, it was like, what's up? I would immediately fall in love with that creature or entity at any, any given moment in time. Just for the mere fact that that happened. It would be like the biggest heathen meat cute of all time. And I would just like never leave that person's side. And so, yeah, no, I would, I would do it. I'm Whatever. But I would just be like, maybe I should have looked more into that. Like, it would be like post. I'd be like, huh. I should have asked more questions before I trusted them with my life. Like, yeah. but I just I mean, just like walking yeah. out to the woods one day, like I need a gothi or I need a rune reading, and like some person just like slides beside a tree and goes, "I knew that." But hey, man, like I my cabin, like I wander the woods, and if I hear people talking, yeah. like I'm like hello, and they probably crap their pants a little. But uh, yeah. I mean, it's it's the what is it still the 21st century? Yeah. Yeah. yeah no, so, I don't know. I want to say it's the 21st. I thought it was like 22nd or some shit. I no, I think know. that's 2,100 years is when it turns out. I'm going to Google it because this is embarrassing. Yeah. I, look at your. I was relative it, I, using I, your I words. Relative. I want to say. What is not, what's the day? Like what? Uh, the 21st century. It says the 21st century began on January 1st, 2001. And will continue through December thirty first of twenty one hundred. So twenty first century. Uh, okay, my statement still stands. We're in the twenty first century. There's crackheads everywhere. They'll do anything for crack. They'll freaking kill someone. Oh. And yeah, don't don't mess around woods, please. Don't, don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so. Why Wolf? What was the question again before we went off this huge tangent oh my God. of uh, I don't remember. Um, someone in the woods and then falling in love and then hopefully yeah, that was a whole crack. That was some, uh, that was like some some uh, Sleeping Beauty crap right there. Um, <laughs> no, so <laughs> what we are and who represent is or 
what we represent is not the Goathar as a whole. Obviously, I'm not going to say I represent every Goathar in the world. Um, it's the Goathar of New Upsala. But we are still Goathar. We are still representing that role. We are still these people. Um, what I'm trying to get across is what is the difference between a modern, everyday, someone that studies this, follows these practices, things like that, um, and an oath sworn, we'll just say that out loud, uh, we'll get into that later, but an actual Gothi, as opposed to a religious conduit of the community that doesn't perform those services. On a regular basis. Regular basis. Like a Facebook heathen as opposed to a Gothi. Yeah, all right. So, mm, that's a that's a really good question. And I don't want to take forever trying to think of it, an appropriate response. So I'm going to shoot it off the hip. Or make somebody an Uphari answer. And we can make it like five words or less. I can't like... <laughs> do that. I can't do that. I can't throw him under the bus when you just threw me under the bus. That's what we do. This is what I do. Yeah, you're the you're the street smart. I'm the book smart, and currently I'm not acting like it. Yeah. Uh. So the normal everyday healing that does a bolot at their own house, they have the best intentions. They have the personal relationship to the gods in their own way. Now, when it comes to uh, oath sworn gothi, um say it with that as opposed to a gothi for a community where they've just i'm gonna all right this is gonna be triggering but a gothi that swore an oath to the gods opposed to a gothi or gothar that swore an oath to the gods and to their community members now a uh, Gothar that swore an oath to the gods, there's still that oath that needs to get done, that will not be abolished. But in a sense, there's no immediate reaction and repercussions for failing that oath. Now, you could say that there are going to be physical repercussions for that but it's not to the same extent if there's a the community finds out that you broke your oath when it comes to an effect of a gothar failing his oath or their oath when it was just for the gods the gods have many things under their table their their tasks and it might not be in their immediate concern. And it might take five years, it might take you, or it might take them 500 years. And they'll find you in the afterlife and be like, so you remember this oath you broke? So we got to talk about that. Now, opposed to swearing an oath to your community and the gods, you have the immediate and, um, later on repercussions for failing that oath whether it be uh repercussions that you set upon yourself um i mean i can go into detail on my oath and like my own repercussions if i break my oath i, I feel comfortable saying that as i don't think we're into that right now okay yeah uh so breaking the oath you got the immediate gothar and they'll take away your ability to do said thing. And what New Uppsala can do as we legally, in the eyes of the government, ordain someone, we'll take that away. And then they'll just be a gothi to their community if they so be it, but not legally ordained. Yeah. Um, so what are, your, what are your thoughts, uh, the difference between a, a I keep saying Facebook heathen because it seems insulting to say, but it's kind of true, it's like a keyboard warrior. Um, what are your thoughts between, like, the, the, the heathen that practices and the Gothar that lives it kind of concept? So, 
I'm going to try to say this as eloquently as I can. Well, this is going to be rough. I'm going to, yeah, I'm going to prepare for this one. Go ahead, though. <laughs> um, the Facebook heathen, I kind of think we're going to coin that term because it's great. Um, they talk a big talk. When it comes time to do heathen shit, they don't. Um, as an old sworn gothi, that becomes no longer an option. Um, a heathen can be a heathen through and through, and they can be very knowledgeable. And I'll caveat all of what I'm saying by that. They can be just the random heathen you meet down the street, walking down the street, and you're like, hey, cool hammer. And they're like, yeah, I read the Poetic Edda 17 times, and I've read this, this, and this. And I know all of these things. They can have that knowledge base. They can have that practice. It's great. The difference is, is they may or may not wake up every morning a heathen. They may go to work and hide it. They may shelter it away from friends or family. As an Osworn Gothi, that no longer happens. Um, you can't hide from it. There's no way to put it out of your life. There's no way to not be a Gothi. There's no way to... I can take off this hammer. I still what I, I'm still a Gothi. I still am who I am. There's no changing. Whereas on Facebook, they can go, Skull! Hail the gods! And you just kind of sit there and go, Yeah, okay. When's the last time you actually were part of a ritual? When were you there? When have you done these things? Maybe it's purely circumstance. I haven't had any. Then that opens up a whole other conversation of, cool, you're coming with me. You get to experience heathen. Experience a bloat and a ritual. But a Facebook heathen versus an old sworn gothi, he can't hide. We're on that watch, the watch list all the time. We are constantly getting asked questions from random people. I was in a Walmart the other day, and this dude walks up and goes, nice hammer. I was like, yeah. And he goes, I had this question one time. I was like, dude, what the fuck? How? How are you, like, asking me questions? You don't even know my name. He's like, I don't know. I just figured you knew stuff. I was like, oh, okay. Sweet. All right, what's your question? And both are cannot hide being. It's not just during a bloat. It's not just during a ritual. It's not just in my own home. I'm a gothi everywhere, all the time. I can't get rid of that, and I don't want to. I love what I do. And I love being that person that can walk into a Walmart, and somebody goes, I have this question about this one thing, and you're like, who are you? But I love those interactions because it brings to light the growth of heathenry in our communities that you may not see every day. I feel lucky to get to see it, but that's the difference between a Facebook heathen and an Osworn Gothi is, I can't hide it. I can't fake it. There's nothing I can do to get rid of it. There's no way that I can cover it up. It is who I am through. That would be the way that I would describe the difference Gothi and an Osworn Gothi and Facebook heathen or anything. In is no. I'm not just a Gothi during a bloat or a rip. Gothi. Love it. And uh, we keep throwing out a, a term that I've seen a lot of people unfamiliar with in the United States of an oath sworn as opposed to a non or whatever else. Uh, and it can be a gothi. There is some decorum to it worldwide where there is certain statues and plates for to have a oath taken. So we keep saying oath sworn, which sounds like this other different type. Kind of is, kind of isn't. Uh, gothar are gothar. Um, however, there are a select few in the world um, that choose a discipline of it as opposed to what they do regularly. Not to discredit any that are not, um, not to discredit those that haven't, don't know of the oath or have not taken an oath of any kind. Uh, 100% spiritual leaders of a community are spiritual leaders of a community. I don't want to discredit that. There is just some level of decorum that does exist in the world where an oath takes place. And that's kind of the same concept of saying you're, it, to me, it's the same as saying, you know, you, you're married by law because you live together for so long, or you got married and took an oath to each other, and now you're married. And that's kind of the, the similarity to me with the gods. Um, cool. No, I love it. Um, I have a few topics. Robert, what do you, what's, what's on your mind? What do you think on this? I just 
butchered what like I'm during Sigurd Ufar's talk and you're talking like wow um I'm a freaking scatterbrain we, we can edit it and you can say it now and then put it before what are you talking about, are you talking about? edits I'm sorry I'm just saying, I'm sorry, you can do this yours now and edit it to the beginning and then just cut this whole thing out. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> just be yeah. like, so, uh, future Robert here talking, I'm cutting out what, uh, I said during the normal podcast because I didn't like it, so I'm gonna write it all down and do it that way. Yeah. Time's not linear, you're fine. Not according to my videos. I'm just kidding. You're muted. It's probably for the best that he's muted right now. That's true. Um, <laughs> cool. Love it. You could do like you could write it all down and be like, due to my failing of speech, here is what I wanted to say, and just black out your screen and have like the Star Wars like lines of script going up it. That's, that's a good Robert idea. answer. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, oh, this is a way bigger answer than I anticipated. Cool, awesome. Yeah. It's like a saga. <laughs> no, so what's going through my head? I'm just honestly gratitude. Gratitude. I mean, I've been doing it with uh, talking with some friends and whatnot, and they brought up gratitude the other day. I was like, "What are you? What are you grateful for?" And honestly, it's the ability to do this and my. All right, fuck it. Fuck you guys, my friends. Oh. <laughs> I was like, what the hell? Before you say something, fuck you. Okay. Yeah. So Randomly. being with my friends, I mean, me and my wife talk, and she's like, Who so who's your closest friend? And I'm like, uh, it's probably gonna be Sigur Ufar and White Wolf. And That's a rough question for me. <laughs> and some other people. Like people and like they're like, Don't you hang out with people that you went to high school with? And I'm like no. What about, what about your time in the military? No. I said bye, and they they said bye. That DD-214 really cut off that relationship real quick. Hey, it's a warm <laughs> blanket, and I wear it every day. It's a snug. It's a snuggie. <laughs> oh, that's a great idea. Oh, no, no, no. Okay, so, tangent. Um, I was in Korea... Oh. And there was actually a DD-214 blanket. Okay. And my friend was like, I should get that for you. And then uh, crochet all your information on it. I've seen it. I've seen the DD-214. Like, you can put it into a website or some shit, and they'll be your shit. Yeah. Like, I love it. It's the best. In fact, did you know the VA will accept that if you... A DD-214 blanket? Yep, as long as it has all the appropriate information and you scan it into that website, the VA is known to accept you bringing the blanket in, and they'll just, like, have you hold it, and they'll take a picture. I would do, like, a 12-foot quilt and be like, here you go! So I'm just gonna <laughs> put this on the ground, because, you know, I'm a Yotun, but I ain't that big of a Yotun. No, but, uh, so, what I'm feeling right now is gratitude. Just being with, yeah. being with my friends. Being with uh, this organization that I did not start, but I'm excited to see where it goes. And I believe, and I'm kind of brainwashed to say it, but I believe in the ideology and the mission behind it. You have succeeded. Ooh. I just meant brainwashing, but yeah, that's cool too. You succeeded, yeah. <laughs> and I said we, we succeeded in brainwashing him into following us. Oh, there you go. That's what it is. Cabin yeah. fever is most of what we call it, but yeah. Stockholm syndrome. There you go. That's a that's well, we're very far away, but yes, that's close. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so I am curious, and this is going to be longer than we need it to be, but. <sighs> what are you talking about? Sigmund and and I will never stop talking, but I still want him to answer first. Um, I am prepared for this question because I thought this would come up, but it hasn't yet, so I'm just going to do it. So, what is a Gothi, and what are their responsibilities? Or Gothar. Now, Gothi, again, the, the male 
version as opposed to Gothia. So Gothar is the plural. So what is the responsibilities and the representation of Gothar? Oh, jeez. Um, That's a loaded question. It is. I know, right? I got a whole, like, PowerPoint about it. So I'm, I'm sure you do. I do. And I'm not a book smart. What's going on right now? Come on. What are you talking? Are about you ready for it to be put to shame by me talking for like two minutes on a whim? Like, are you ready? Okay. I'm recording. Both these responsibility me. is to guide and teach the larger community in the ways of heathenry by performing the bloats and being the bridge to the gods, so that everyone can cross learn from them, so that the gods can cross us. The responsibilities of a Gothi is to teach, learn, guide. That is our responsibility. To put it as simply as I possibly can. teach, learn, guide. Okay, so that's that's awesome. Um, how do you do that now, as opposed to how it was done before? Well, technology. Um... I don't have to be face to face with someone to tell them the story of the creation anymore. I don't have to be face to face with them to communicate how a ritual can be done or what they can do themselves. I don't have to do that anymore. I don't have to have them send me a written letter with a runner on a horseback for two weeks to get to where I am and have me ride two weeks back and find that their family is in absolute chaos because some land white decided to screw them. Whatever that is, there is. I don't have that issue anymore. That, that's not a problem for. Me. I have text I would, still, I would still take that over TSA any day. Yeah, TSA sucks. Um, um, another one outside of technology is we are far more literate than our ancestors were. In many ways, we have books in different languages now. So if someone that speaks Portuguese, for example wants to learn about our gods. Cool. Here's this crazy translation that I found in fucking Portuguese on Amazon Marketplace that you can read, because I can't speak to you, but here's the link. But we have a lot of those things more readily available. Um, the world got a lot smaller and a lot bigger all at the same time. Every book. It's huge because we look and we can communicate with someone in Portugal or Ukraine or wherever. We can communicate with them over whatever media we want. But they're still that far away. So there's still limitations, but that would be the biggest change to me is the ease of communication over distance, the availability of material. Oh, yeah. Uh, Robert, what do you think? What, are your, what is your rendition on what Gothar are, what we do or represent as our singular being? And how we bring it to the modernized world as opposed to our ancestral. So I'm going to start off with the ancestors. You, from my knowledge, we each uh, village, each tribe had their own individual Gothar and their own individual pra town practice. When individually equals town in this context. Uh, so it's not, not one gothi per person. No, 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 no. That would be <laughs> one to one. That's ratio. Babysitting? <laughs> I wonder how that would work. Imagine you own, not like, well. if you could own <laughs> Gothar for one person. Absolute unadulterated chaos would unfold. 100%. I would drown them. I would drown them. Yes. What there would be like, <laughs> you've seen me and White Wolf get into it about our little stuff where we're like, nope, I disagree with what you're saying. And we're like going at each other. Imagine that with everybody in a 200 person town and they all have this attached person next to them arguing. It would just be a, maybe, and it would just be a town of, uh, uh, eventually, it'd be a town of Gothar because all of the other would be dead. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. No, you're good. You're good. So, a Gothar in the olden times with our ancestors, there was usually one Gothar for the town, and there was most of the time a patron um, god associated with that town where they 
highly venerated opposed to what we have now, which is very more polytheistic and it's less monotheistic in a polytheistic religion. Now, if you don't know what that means, monotheistic means you believe in one God. So very commonly nowadays, the Abrahamic phase versus polytheistic, which you believe in more than one God, which very generally you got Hindu um, and paganism is very common these days for polytheism. So modern day Gothar versus an, uh, ancestor Gothar, very, very similar, but very different. It, it's less community, but more community at the same time. Less community versus your immediate surroundings uh, so less I'm trying to word it. It's very hard because I wanted. I to I don't think it's less. It's less immediate and more large scale, essentially. It's it's like you have you're you're living in a small town where everyone knows everyone. You got cousin Bob right down the street, and you've known him since birth versus living in a big city and cousin Bob is a 15 minute bike ride away. That that's kind of that's kind of what uh I'm picturing right now versus uh ancestral Gothar versus modern day Gothar. Your community is very tight in ancestral and in modern day it's less tight but more broad. Higher population, lower density. See, why do you always have to, like, make my statements, like, ten times better? Not that I'm making them better, I'm just clarifying. Because I know what you're saying, and I want your voice to be heard in a way that the masses will understand. Holy hell. <laughs> now I'm just insulted. I think you just Robert, said dumb. Robert, don't listen to anything he just said at all. <laughs> Holy shit. <laughs> It's so much easier to paraphrase than it is to phrase. Like, come on. <laughs> okay. All right, all right, my bad. I'm sorry. I love you, Robert. No, I love you, too. I all right, White Wolf, what does it mean versus ancestral versus modern-day Gothar? Well, it means a lot of shit. Uh, ancestral and beforehand, I mean... Uh, Everything you guys said is absolutely accurate, and a lot of things are way better put than I would have thought of. Um, it's the same job, regardless of the era, the generation, the millennia, the whatever it is. Um, to Sigurd Upar's point, we are we represent or claim to be the bridge of opaque colors that comes together as the Bifrost, essentially in representation of saying we connect the gods to the people. That's across the board what a Gothi is, right? A Gothar. Um, now, the way I put it before, which, of course, I'm an asshole, so I'm going to read shit. Um, what I have on here, which is paraphrasing myself at best, is the old Norse word Gothar is the plural for Gothi of Guthia. A Gothar is the collective spiritual representation of the Asatra community. Proper pronunciation of this is Gothar, and in literal terms, it actually does translate to um, who speaks with a god, those who speak with a godly tongue or the god tongue. Now, I don't want that to sound like the god tongue, but that is the godly tongue of representation of the gods. Um, we know from many uh, surviving ancient accounts. Um, the Gothar played a pivotal role in the founding of Iceland and the development there of a system of government known as the Gothic Republic, or the Gothic Republic. Um, this ancient method of uh, self-governing was known as an all-thing, a thing, or whatever you want to call it. Um, at the all-thing, the Gothar have 36 districts, or however many there were, um, of Iceland uh, met together annually to read the law, settle disputes amongst folks, and meet justice as lawbreakers. So what this sounds like is much larger than what we're talking about. And it is, and it was, it's not now. 
Um, then, Gothar were basically the government of people. Um, there were Jarls, there were kings, there were all these things, tribal leaders, whatever you want to call it. Uh, but annually, they would meet at an all thing. They would come together, and, and people that had broken laws, who had done things that were outside of the norm or, or larger than the representation of the community, had been met by Gothar in order to find the justice of how to deal with these situations. Now, this could be anything from bylaws on trade routes to someone that murdered somebody in cold blood. Like, this is a huge range of spectrum. It's basically Judge Jerry Executioner, but a large amount of it. Um, they were responsible for establishing hoffs and temples um, and maintained the equipment and furnishings necessary to conduct bloats and other religious services. Now, this means anything from oiling a fucking bowl and vacuuming the grounds or sweeping the grounds to creating the safe space or spiritual grounds for it to take place on. Um, in the days of the Gothic Republic, back in the day, um, it was also uh, responsible for the civil admin or administration of the country as well. So this would mean that they would help dictate, decide, and vote on, to a certain degree, who would be an administrative authority and be in charge of these grounds. Now, what that looks like now is obviously very, very different. Um, in modern times, the Asatru community as a whole, not say the Asatru community, the community of Asatru people, um, do struggle um, to reassert itself as a religion of the folk because of so many religions being able to happen, from the flying spaghetti monster to Christianity. There's tons of this middle ground. Those are all real religions. Uh, <laughs> Not only is it our con duty to conduct bloats, maintain the hops and sacred groves, and provide the ritual equipment, but we must also seek out those within our community uh, to practice the old ways. Uh, we call it a reawakening, not because it's a revival. Uh, a lot of times you'll hear re a revival of an old religion, of our spirituality, of a whatever you want to call it. Uh, but really, it's a reawakening. This practice has never been gone. We can actually date it back further than we could. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of dates back. And where it says Christianity was, or uh, I'm sorry, paganism or Asatru was cut off up to these modern times, uh, there is actually a timeline between those two things. Um, it's basically to reawaken the ancestral soul of people, with, which, is, which has just been dormant. It hasn't been gone. It hasn't been dead. It has been something, this isn't news, we're not groundbreaking, we're not pioneering, we're simply waking up something that has been basically a hibernation for thousands of years. So to me, a Gothi, or Gothar, is someone that represents something older than we can understand in ways that we still will never fully or grasp the concept of, but we intend to learn as much as we can, dedicate our lives to it, and do our best to make sure our future generations have proper representation of the gods or bring them closer to it. And that's why I usually talk last, because I talk a lot. And the best well put. That was, that was solid. You got a lot more into the history of things. A lot more definitions. But no, I, I agree. I, I study history to find, you know, Facts in the modern world. That's what the discipline of the Sentinel does. How bad I don't want to throw shade right now. <laughs> I'm not going to, but I wanted to. No, that was really well put. And it dove into a lot more of the definitions and the different sides of things. A lot more of the historical. Now, you did say in there um, that it wasn't a revival. This culture never died. Um, and we can go into a lot of that, but we don't need to specifically on this one. But you kind of subvertly mentioned that in that time where history says Norse paganism died, and now still had practitioners. To elaborate a little bit more on that, uh, just kind of nail that part of it home. I'll Okay, uh, I'll try. Uh, <laughs> so, th there's a huge era, and people can call it what they want to call it. Everyone has their own version of like the Dark Ages, and I'm just going to call it that. So, for heathenry, the Dark Ages 
came right around the Crusades. Um, since then, there has not been a lot of heathenry worldwide in a, in a volume worth mentioning. Now, there's grottos, there's towns, there's folk ships that do these things, but they're kind of the outcast, the odd man out, things like that. Uh, that's been going on since the Crusades took place, since beforehand, since Christianity started taking over the world, and albeit whatever the hell. Um, but the difference is, is a lot of people say, and a lot of people that I know say that I'm very close to, is that you know, Christianity is the dominant religion of the world. That's not even a debate. That's just obvious fact. Um, it's claimed that it had been a much like not too long ago we'd sell St. Patrick's Day chasing the snakes out of Ireland or the, what it actually is the pagans out, right? Representing the, the basically the purification of paganism, heathenism as a whole around the world. So a lot of people see that because it has been such a far-fetched concept to have this in particular group of gods or representations still exist is become dead dormant or whatever you want to call it now everyone says it's dead everyone says it's gone and now this whole modernization is a recreation or a remodernization remodernization of something that's already existed obviously to a degree that's true obviously we do not live in the same time our ancestors we don't have the same exposure they do to their stories and their tales and a big part of that is because a lot of our ancestors and the way we know our stories is through word of mouth even written word didn't come around until christianity or argue before that and started recording stories it was all word of mouth campfire stories everything else um, we've mentioned before different tribes different cities having different representations it's the same idea every tribe or city had the same pantheon the gods represented something different. Where Thor may have been the god of crops because he brings rain in one town, the other town he would have been the gods of blacksmith because they wielded a hammer and used an anvil. So these different aspects, albeit minute, are large enough that they change the viewing platform or the concept of what the gods are. Now, once worldwide swept to the point of Christianity as the norm, it was kind of dismissed. It all became hobbies, trinkets, charms, things like that. You'll see Mjolnirs, you'll see here and there, um, crosses instead of Mjolnirs, and it started slow conversions, even the holidays. Obviously, Easter to Ostara, uh, we're not going to talk about Midsummer and Yule, but all these different religious holidays that don't fall into the Christian timeline, but do match perfectly with those before. So this is something that's been around forever and it was made that way because it was indoctrinated by our ancestors by saying we're not going to tell you what to do but we're going to change your ostara and we're going to call it easter and the common norm became easter even though it's the same concept same teachings and most people that i know at least as a christian cannot tell me why there's a rabbit and eggs during easter but, but as a heathen many can so this is no way something that's saying, you know, Christianity is just a ripoff. There's no way saying heathenism is the first and only. This is a simple concept of saying we did exist. We set the groundwork, albeit we lost the majority vote, but we by no means lost the race. Uh, we've been dormant. We've been tired. We've been sleeping. And very gradually amongst us, last 15 to 20 years as far as i've seen it's a very slow awakening but a large awakening worldwide we are trying to get that majority number back crazier things have happened crazier things have happened i want to say in one of the scandinavian um countries like norway sweden denmark and all of them <clears throat> Most, the the highest uh, religion is paganism, verse, and then the second is Christianity. I can't remember, there, but I remember seeing something like that. There's more than one, actually, in the European countries and Scandinavian that is actually still the prominent religion is essentially what they call heathenism or paganism. Now, that's a big monoc 
cultural, or I don't know, sorry, word. it's a big mistranslation of what that means. Um, a lot of people say it's one thing, a lot of people say it's another. Um, in my opinion, heathenism, as opposed to paganism, just heathen as a whole, is basically the non-representation or non-belief of the, of the uh, Abrahamic gods. Where other people would say heathenism is not the representation of the cultural norm. So, in for where I am from is Utah. If you're not a he, if you're not a Mormon, you're a heathen. Where in reality, if you are just not a Judaic or Abrahamic following, you are still a heathen. So it's kind of this whole thing because you go somewhere else, and it could be, for example, if you went to Norway. And they believed in a Satru more than anything else, right? Then any Christian would be a heathen. And they would be heathenistic. Now they're heathens. It's a whole different game. And so that kind of heathenism translation comes to a different cultural aspect, I would say, as opposed to a direct translation. Yeah. But yeah, no, you're not wrong. There's a, there's a few countries that still are mostly... No. And heavily heathen or and or pagan. Um, I just want to throw this out there because a lot of people don't know this. The definition of pagan. For Oxford languages, I just googled it. Um, a person holding religious beliefs other than those of the main or recognized religions. And that's so, pagan as opposed to heathen. That is pagan. Okay. Heathen is a totally different thing. Um, it has a bunch of different definitions. I personally say I am a heathen gothi because I will not discredit or dismiss a Celtic god over anything else. I have 42 Norse pagan gods that we know of pretty standard. Who am I to say that there's not three more somewhere that go by different names? I don't know. I can't discredit that. I can't say, oh, no, no, you're wrong. No, that's bullshit. I can't say that. So, I consider myself a heathen. But I also like to point out that in the Middle East, per se, a Christian, a normal Christian, whether it's Catholic or whatever, would be considered a pagan. Kind of crazy to think about, but that's the reality of the situation. They would be considered a pagan in a lot of ways. And so I'm saying, it's like we say paganism, heathenism, all this stuff, but it's why we have to to a certain degree, classify it between, if you could say Christianic or Christianity, and that could be anything which I'm not going to even try to understand the entire aspect of that, but it could be Catholic, Mormon, Lutheran, whatever else, the different sects of each one, right? Even a lot of monks are Christian monks. When we start dealing with, I, will, I guess, paganism, which I would, would have said heathenism as a whole, is every sect of every pantheon. And the fact that we just follow that one individual pantheon. Whether it's one or 60, it's just what we do. I agree entirely. It's, it's definitely the definitions and the common understanding of words like pagan or heathen or one of Abrahamic faith, whatever you want to call that. Those definitions in today's world are very skewed. And I think the story of how they started calling, especially Norse pagans and Celtic pagans, heathens, was one of the funniest things ever, because it was, I think it's great, where they go in, you have some European king go, filthy heathens, you godless heathens, whatever, and we all went, yeah, no, that tracks. Yep. It works. <laughs> But yeah, no, I just think that that side of it's funny. Yeah. Um, I do digress. Uh, Robert, do you have um, do you have anything you want to talk about on this particular yeah. opening podcast or anything, subject matter wise? Yeah. I, my last, you brought it up so good to Ufar, but the last thing that I think we could cover is a little about our path and what we uh, try to venerate. Ah. You're going to have to do so much editing, man. I'm so sorry. Yeah, this is going to get rough. Or, or <laughs> we could talk about 
if you go and you walk up to Walmart and you see a normie and they see the hammer, you're like, what do you call yourself? Do you call yourself a heathen? A Norse pagan? Okay, okay, we can get into that. Oh my god, this is going to be more editing. This is going to be because of, like, legal editing. I haven't been timeline beforehand. This is going to be, like... Legal rude. editing? Nah. I don't know what he's about to say. He's going to send crazy shit. You ready? Um... <laughs> oh boy. Oh dear, that was not the same noise I was expecting. Alright, anyways. <laughs> um, so what do I do when... As you said, a normie. A normie. I'm going to say Facebook heathen. No, I'm just kidding. Um, no, no, no. A, like a normie, like someone that doesn't know anything about paganism and is like... Oh, okay, nice okay, humor. okay. Nice jewelry. Yeah, okay. So, nice living place. where I live, it is heaven, heavily Christian, which is most places in the US. Um, so I get questioned a lot, and it's a blast. Because they'll walk up and they'll be like, hey, what's your necklace for? What is that? Like, oh, I'm Norse pagan. I'm a heathen. The reactions to that statement can range from <gasps> to what does that mean to hey, that's super cool. Can you tell me more? Like, I've been trying to read stuff. Like, can you can we talk? Um, I think my favorite ones are the I hate to say it, but the little old lady reactions to somebody saying, "Oh yeah, I'm I'm a pagan and I'm heathen." Those reactions are the most fun to witness because they're just like, no, I'm a normal person. Like, I've got my family with me. I've got all of these things. And I was like, we're going to do anything. We're in a Walmart. Like, even if we were in a Walmart, what did you expect me to do? I still live by the land, laws of the land. Like, I'm not going to do anything crazy, but that's who I am. Um, so those are those are the most fun, honestly, because they're, they're just a blast. And yeah, then you fun. get, yeah, they're they're great. Um, but then there's the other ones that are the curiosity, the ones that come up and go, Hey, I I saw that kind of hammer on Etsy one time, and I'm just curious what it's about. And my standard answer across the board for anybody that comes up to me and goes, Hey, I want to know more about Norse paganism or Asatru or heathenry or whatever you want to call it. I want to know more about it. My first and only answer to them is go read the Havamal. Here's how you can reach me. Talk to me after you read. And they're like, well, where do I get it? And I was like, you can Google that. Yeah. Like, the Havamal's everywhere. Go Google the Havamal. You look disheveled as hell. You look like you just got hit by a bull. You. Yes, you. Um, Why, Wolf, you look handsome, and I love you. <laughs> Thank you, Robert. <laughs> Fuck you, Sigvid Uthar. Yeah, okay. Um, but no. Always, I send people to the Havamal first. Um, that is like my first standard, and they go, well, what's the Havamal? And my standard answer, while it's not complete, but in those initial interactions is, it's Odin's words on how people should behave. On what the, I don't want to say laws, but the guidelines. Yeah. Not so much a law as it is. Um, the guidelines of how humanity should behave and how we should treat each other. And those reactions, because oftentimes I'll get people to reach back out to me through Facebook, Discord, whatever it is, and they'll go, hey, so why does this sound so familiar? Why did this hit my Why did I relate to this so much? And oftentimes I'll just get that little smirk like, well, welcome home. If that's the if that's the feeling you got that resonation of this made sense this is what I've wanted to understand. this is where I want to go welcome home welcome to Eden Riasachu whatever title you want to put on it welcome to home and then oftentimes they'll go down like crazy ass rabbit holes that go nowhere and they're just like spinning their wheels and they're like I gotta learn everything and I'm like pump the brakes hotshot there's like a whole book you gotta read to even understand half the names that you're gonna hear in the other one but um no always a them all first but I love the different range of reactions to the little old lady that's never seen a pagan before in her life but has always heard the stories from her pastor or whatever to uh curiosities and then there's always the marvel dudes 
They're like, nice hammer, bro. And I'm like, oh my. Dude, I've seen Thor. Really? Too. It's my favorite movie. Yeah. The, oh, wait, the wait, bro. Isn't he from Fortnite? Yeah. Oh. The, the bro saw true people. Is that what I'm saying? 100%. Yeah. I know. So I love those interactions. I love the random interactions like on the street. Um, where I live, there's often like pagan markets that happen. Jones. And they go for anybody like Wiccans, Druidic pagans, heathens, Asatru, and everybody just shows up. And it's like this massive trade fair of different things. And you'll see bartering happen there. And it's, I love the community that's starting to build behind all of our different sects of paganism. Um, but it's a blast. I love and those interactions. I love the rants. So I heard, Robert, I was not far from your house last Saturday, and there is large pagan markets every Saturday. Donde esta, senor? Just telling you, not far. It's like right near your work. Like, it's close, all right? Oh, I, I don't like to go in there when I'm not at work. We That's what I'm about that. That's where it is. Yeah, th- you won't catch it's me on a It's a great Saturday market. It's not a great place. But the market's fantastic. <laughs> oh. right. yeah. So, White Wolf. When you go see a normie, all right, normie as in Facebook, or sorry, not Facebook, uh, you go to Walmart and someone says, nice hammer, nice tattoos. What do you believe in? How do you respond? No. Um, it, it depends on the person, honestly. I'm not going to say, like, you know, judge a book by its cover because that's impossible to do with a human relation, but you see someone to a certain degree, you can kind of decide what you're going to tell this person. Um, uh, you know, if, if someone says like, you know, I like your hammer, I don't often. This is like completely like I'm gonna get persecuted by the entire social community. I don't often wear a hammer. Okay, it's not a, like a thing that I wear very often. I have tons of them. Um, I usually give them away, like nonstop. I've been through like at least thirty that have cost way more money because I'm like. This is going to be mine, and then I give it away for free for no fucking reason. There's a lot of reasons. Um, but if someone comes to me and asks me about, you know, generally what actually happens, they ask me about my rings, my jewelry, right? Um, so they're like, oh, your rings, this and this. A lot of my rings, a lot of my jewelry does have a representation towards the Nordic gods or my beliefs. Some of it is just my personal preference of decoration or whatever else. Um but hypothetically, if someone comes up, and it does happen sometimes, I'm going to fix my camera real quick. If someone does come up and ask me a question on my jewelry, heathenism, or like, what do you believe, or whatever else, I can dumb it down, or I can escalate in any direction. I can say, have you ever seen the movie Thor, to like what Sivitter said, have you seen the movie Thor? They're like, yeah. I'm like, yeah, it's like that, but it's, it's real. And they're like, I don't understand. I'm like, I know. So that's why I said Thor. Um, so... <laughs> A lot of times I'm like, yeah, you know, I'm what's called a Satru. Um, you know, it's it's a Satru, it's paganism, a lot of people say Odinism. It's a lot of different words that do mean different things, but the most common colloquial term that I use is a Satru. Like, I'm a Satru. I believe in the Norse pantheon. I believe in every god that exists, every religion that exists. I just choose to follow the Norse pantheon, which means Odin, Vili, Ve, Thor, Loki, all these things and all these beings... But I take it as a real religion. I do practice that. Nine times out of ten, they're like, holy cool, crap, that's so cool. Um, not a lot of people ask follow-up questions because it's way over their head at that degree uh, until they go home and Google it. Um, but sometimes they do. Sometimes they are. Sometimes they say, like, what does that look like? Like, how do you, like, worship? What do you do on a daily basis? And they're like, I've had one time where someone, like, oh, like, do you pray to them? And I'm like, no, I don't pray. Like. As a common practice of my m- mentality, I don't pray ever. Now, what bloats are, what symbols are, what rituals are, what offerings are, are not prayer to me. They are offerings, those exact things. Um, I've described it a few times to my own family, who is very Christian, um, that I don't think any god that I follow in any pantheon of the Satru, of the Ace Theater, or anything else, is what we actually usually call a god. 
right? So in Christian terms, God is the all-knowing, all-being, invincible, perpetual, one thing, con- the only constant in the conceptual reality. The to me, yeah, to me, it's a little g, lowercase g. I know that because I already know how they're going to die. I know my gods will die. I know exactly how they're... Uh, mine's probably backwards. I know how they're going to die. I know that they'll die. And I know that they didn't exist to create us. It just was happening at the same time. So the biggest thing I come up with discussion-wise with people that are not of our belief system, cultures, values, even aware of them, Let's say, yeah, I do follow these these gods and, and goddesses. I have this entire pantheon of people that I follow. Um, more often than not, it comes down to the question of individual gods and who is your patron god, which is very Christianic. Uh, but for the most part, I just like, you know what? I know my gods will live, are alive, and I know they will die just as our gods of them died before them. And just as I know, those of our gods will live past Odin and the gods we know now. Um, so I try to make it very transparent that I'm not saying Asatru is the religion. I'm saying I follow this pantheon. It is fleeting, but it is constant in its revival. And that's kind of the, the way. And, it's, and I mean, I'm serious when I say, like, I pace it out depending on who I'm talking to. Because I just see, like, deer in the headlights. I'm like, yeah, no, Thor... Okay, but if I'm even, like investing, but actually following with questions, I'll get a little more in depth without like trying to like recruit them, but saying you know I do this because of this, and they'll usually follow up with like individual questions of the gods of Odin, Thor, whomever else, or who they're most familiar with because of Marvel. Yeah, and that's where I go from there. Hey, you remember our pop culture talk? That's what we mean. <laughs> oh. <laughs> to to answer my own question of if I walk up. If I'm walking at Walmart and a normie comes up to me and mm, nice tattoos, uh, nice hammer, um, do you mind if I ask about it? I mean, most of the time they ask about my tattoos and everything because that's always on display. Uh, they don't really see my um, hammer at all. They don't really come up. No one really comes up and talks about my hammer. Um, but. I'd be like, all right, have you seen Vikings? Mm. Okay, you've seen Vikings. Have you watched Thor? Yeah, you've watched Thor. Okay. Thor isn't blonde. Thor doesn't have abs. Thor is a redhead. Thor is a bodybuilder. And Vikings lifestyle is what I try to venerate. So you are saying you're Thor. I mean, <laughs> wow! For it. Red hair, oh, big guy, know. like Viking lifestyle. Like, yeah. I just I like, like, <laughs> and Robert said like three times about Yoden shit. He's taller than fuck. Uh, like, I'm a giant. his house looks like a museum to me, just to fit him in it. Like, I walk in, I'm like, I couldn't get these ceilings, and he will like touch the ceiling. Yeah. Like, it's. It's intense. Yeah, it's ridiculous. Like, I walked up to him and I was like, oh, you're big. Yeah. Like, uh, whoa. I'm, dude. Like, I'm, like, I'm like here on him. Like, maybe, yeah. maybe, oh, maybe, God. maybe right. mid ribs. He's, he's yeah, tall if dude. You're, uh, if you're listening via audio, he was pointing, White Wolf was pointing at the ribs. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> mid rib. Yeah. No, so that that's usually how I describe. And that's my first thing I talk about, like, Nine times out of ten. Have you seen Vikings? Have you seen Thor? Well, it's not like that, but it, that's what I tried to do. If I put them together, exactly. it's close. <laughs> um, I mean, thankfully, with uh, God of War Ragnarok being came out, I can start referencing. I didn't even think about that. We can reference yeah. that and be like, that's actually what Thor looks like. I've never played it. How is that? Uh, you need to look at the character art for what they depicted Thor as, because yes. in my opinion, they fucking nailed it. I put it on social media. Did you? Yeah, I did. Wow. Oh, okay. Dude, I don't have PlayStation and I my social media socials. are lacking at best. I put it on okay. our socials. <gasps> oh! Oh, no! I, 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 I
I don't look at anything <laughs> on social media. You'll be lucky if I respond to questions unless you're like live video at some point. And I'm like, oh yeah, this person just commented because I'll be actually. Yeah, 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 yeah. But all right, so if they if they ask questions, right? Yeah. Um, I mean, like I said uh, previously, you know, time in the military, I was in the military and spent a lot of hours just sitting around doing nothing and talking to my coworkers. Best topics is usually what's happening in football, if it's football season, and then religion. That's kind of like the best two topics to talk about while sitting in a Humvee for 12 hours watching the grass grow. And yeah, yeah. they're like, they they ask him, be like, so Odin, right? He, t- he has one eye. I'm like, yep, he has one eye. Okay. Um, he rides a horse, like a normal horse. No, but he rides a horse. The Wait, horse a good has eight, eight legs, but... It's a well, we can story. dive into that story. I will happily dive into that well, story. No, well, we're, 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 we're All right near now. the end. We're near the end. I know. All right <laughs> now, but later, we can totally get into that, because that's... Yeah, but that that's usually, like, I break it down into itty-bitty pieces that they can digest, and, um, yeah, that's that's where we try to use the the pop culture, is just... Most of the time, the pop culture is used for those introductory meetings. And it's purely find some common ground. All right. Where do we go from here? Yep. I agree. So, like you said, we're close to the end at this point. Um, I would like to say if you guys have questions, our viewers, if you guys have any questions at all, or yeah, whatever. Any questions at all, shoot them to us on social media. Um, we have a Facebook page. We have an Instagram. Those are out there. This will get put wherever Robert decides to put it. I don't know right now. Get that <laughs> yeah. out later. Um, we'll have it on these sources. You guys can message us through most of those, I believe. Um, shoot us some questions. We'll start collecting those in every five, six episodes or whatever it turns out being. We'll answer those questions. We'll sit down and go through them and We'll go through that. Now, we probably won't answer questions like, what does Odin look like? I don't know, dude. He's missing an eye. He's got white hair and wide brim hat and all that. Cool. But He has a stick. We'll answer your questions. Yeah, he does have a stick. <laughs> um, but no, we'll go through all those at some point, but I this was enjoyable. Mm-hmm. Um, I like being able to talk about this and their stuff out. Yeah. Uh, I would say some of the same thing. Uh, we're nearing the end. Uh, my kind of final blip will be that uh, this is the, the trial run period that you guys are listening to, watching, whatever else. Um, we do intend to get to stuff that is actually much, much more deeper thoughts. Um, there will be literally talk of runes, or translations, sigils, rituals, things like that. Um, you know, I, I'm someone that absolutely loves The Office. As a personal oh, yes. person, Most definitely. Uh, however, sometimes the first season's pretty cringy, so don't <laughs> just look us right now as the first season. Yes. Like, give us give us a chance. Uh, we will get much into much more depth, personal personifications. All we're doing right now is setting up the groundwork. Uh, we actually want to hear from everybody else uh, about this and how we can make this a better system. Um, again, this is the groundwork. We want to build on top of your concepts and ideas. Um, so, if you are listening to us, watching us, it would be super cool if you did it again. I know I have a few people that will, out of obligation, because they're mostly related to me, but they'll still do it. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, I, I really do look forward to this. Um, this is something I hope we make very regularly. Um, it gets a little steam off our chest. Yeah. It'll steal off our chest. We get to answer questions that we get every day, all the time. Um, again, as David Utfado says, and Robert has clearly pointed out, he uh, is going to decide on how this gets out. So hopefully it's great. Yeah, um, <laughs> Go ahead. So uh, last final notes. To everyone that made it this far, we greatly appreciate your time and dedication. Time is a very limited so- resource that you have, and we are grateful to the extreme detail that you decided to spend 
some of it on us. And as Y Wolf said, this is very trial based. We've n- neither one of us have done a podcast in our past and we're running with the punches right now. We're learning what works, what doesn't work, but our mission is to grow, to grow the word of heathenry to not recruit, but as to spread knowledge, um, knowledge is power. Knowledge comes from anywhere. Um, greatly appreciative each and every one of you. And thank you for listening to the new Uppsala podcast on any device you are listening to. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. Look to see you guys again.